Well, welcome everybody to another segment of Lewis at Large. Here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck, and of course that means some smart talk radio is in your future. And uh, this segment, uh, I can tell you with uh, full assurance that in over 600 shows, we've never talked about maple syrup. I'm not even sure we've uttered those two words uh, together before, but today we will. Uh, a fascinating look, uh, a work called The Sugar Season, A Year in the Life of Maple Syrup and One Family's Quest for the Sweetest Harvest. The author is Doug Wynut. Doug is a prolific writer. Uh, he is an associate professor of writing at Boston's Emerson College. He lives in New Hampshire. Of course he lives in New Hampshire. Uh, he has written, as I said, prolifically for the New York Times, Boston Globe, Discover, Smithsonian, Reader's Digest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are happy to have him here to talk about all things maple syrup. Doug, how are you, my friend? I'm fine. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Well, we are pleased to have you here. Uh, interesting that this is brought up on just on a personal note. Uh, recently, I was with a gathering of friends, and we had waffles uh, as part of a brunch that was going on, and there was a great debate over the more uh, common brand, so to speak, of uh, like Mrs. Butterworth and Log Cabin versus the real thing, and uh, why not? Uh, first of all, uh, share with our Lewis at Large listeners, uh, if you would, uh, a little bit more about your background. Um, my background getting into the book was um, the fact that uh, when we moved to New Hampshire in 97, my wife became a school teacher. Uh, and she had a third grade class that she would take out to the sugar house uh, each year. Now, the sugar house is a place where they make maple syrup. They gather sap from maple trees during uh, this time of the year when winter turns into spring. And then they bring it into the sugar house and they boil the sap down um, until it has a high sugar content. It starts off at 2% and they boil it down to about 66 or 67%. And that's when it becomes maple syrup. So. Um, she liked doing it, and she took me to see the sugar house, and then it became a ritual for us. So we, we, we started doing it every year and going to other sugar houses in the area. There are hundreds and hundreds of sugar houses in New Hampshire and Vermont and in uh, some of the other states and in Canada as well. So in 2009, there was the discovery of an invasive insect in Worcester, Massachusetts. It's called the Asian longhorn beetle. It loves maple trees. It had come over on packing crates and gotten out into the trees in Worcester, infested a lot of them. And as a result, 20,000 trees were cut down and a quarantine was established around that area. Well, when I read about it, I wondered what would happen if that bug got up into the maple trees in New Hampshire and Vermont? What would happen to the maple syrup uh, industry and culture? And what would happen to the fall foliage and so on and so forth? So I called the man who I knew was the biggest producer of maple syrup uh, in the state of New Hampshire. His name is Bruce Bascom. Um, and uh, last year, he and his uh, workers produced 28,000 uh, gallons of maple syrup. And I talked to him about this bug um, and uh, asked him what he thought about it. And he talked about it uh, a bit. He had some concerns, but wasn't all that concerned because the, this, this insect doesn't migrate it migrates quickly within trees, but outside of trees, it doesn't migrate all that quickly. So he thought the quarantine would hold it back. But at the end of our conversation, he said, there's a lot more to the maple syrup industry than people know about. And that I sort of took that as being in, an invitation to continue the conversation. So I ended up going back there again and again to the 2010 uh, sugaring season, 2011 and 2012. And my book is based on the 2012 season. I'm curious as to, I think when uh, a lot of people think of, of maple syrup and they think of the bucket sitting uh, on pegs uh, on the side of trees, they're thinking maybe similar of how uh, in certain parts of the country they make moonshine or that they, they craft beer, home crafted beer, et cetera. This is in many ways, uh, is was it not historically a cottage industry? It, it was. And um, in this little town in New Hampshire, um, Bruce likes to talk about how back in the, the centennial of this country, there were 154 farms in a, in, a, in a fairly small town with about 8,000 people. There were 154 farms making maple sugar, and they produced a lot of it. Uh, each farm had an average, well, there was an average of 500 trees per farm, uh, and they produced a whole bunch of sugar. It was a dry sugar back in those days. So it was very much a cottage industry, and it still is in some places. 
but Bruce Bascom's family has been at it for several generations, and Bruce's father, Bruce's father Ken Bascom, uh, did it by the old traditional way of putting buckets on trees and hanging the buckets on the spouts. He had 7,000 buckets and made anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 gallons. But when Bruce came home from college uh, in uh, 1972, there was, a, there was a, a change going on in the industry uh, wherein um, producers were turning from buckets on trees to plastic tubing, and they were experimenting with ways to, um, to attach plastic tubing to the spouts in the trees and then pull the sap out of the trees into a central location. So Bruce's senior project in an entrepreneurial management course was to devise a system by which 25,000 taps drained through plastic tr- tubing into a central sugar house. Uh, and so when he came home from college, he, he had trouble convincing the bankers to loan him $5,000 to, uh, to uh, start a tubing system. But um, his father uh, helped him to get that loan. And within a few years, he had those 25,000 taps in the largest tubing system in New Hampshire and, uh, they say, in New England. Uh, and that led to... Um, his business being commercially viable because it takes a lot of labor to empty 7,000 buckets. If they work really hard with the whole crew, they can do it in two days. So that was the change, and that revolutionized the industry. Right, and so I would assume now that's pretty much the industry standard. Is that correct? 90% of the, of the maple syrup that's produced uh, is produced that way. How, what? Uh, give us some sense of perspective here. What? How much... How many jars, and let's just say a 24-ounce jar, for, for lack of a, of a better measurement, would, would a, a tree produce in a year? How much does a tree produce? Yeah. About a half a gallon on, on plastic tubing um, with buckets and spouts, about a quart of maple syrup. And, of course, that goes, it multiplies out to gallons of sap. So if a tree on buckets produces 10 gallons of sap, you get about a quart of syrup. If uh, a tree with plastic tubing produces um, uh, 20 gallons of syrup, you can get a half gallon. So they, they try for about a half gallon, and they're, they're edging up above that with a more advanced system. That sounds, that sounds like that could, could be amazingly expensive. That, that seems, I'm, that's intriguing to me. That's, that's right, and that's why it costs so much, because it's labor-intensive, and then it's energy-intensive uh, to boil it down. So that's why... You know, you mentioned the artificial syrup, uh, pancake syrup, that everyone knows so well. It's an $18 billion industry, uh, and, it's, and it's based on that iconic flavor of maple, that special flavor that has the characteristics of those minerals in the tree and that little vanilla taste to it that kind of pops in your mouth. That iconic flavor is what the whole culture of maple syrup production is built on and the artificial, the $18 billion artificial industry. In the U.S., the uh, maple industry is about $150 million a year industry, and a, and a quart of maple syrup might cost you 15 to $18, whereas you know, a, a, a bottle of uh, the uh, Vermont Made and the other stuff might cost you 3 or $4, three or four for an equivalent amount. If you've just joined us, uh, yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck of Lewis at Large Radio. In this segment, uh, we're talking to Douglas Wynott. He is a prolific author. Uh, and we're talking specifically about a new work called The Sugar Season, A Year in the Life of Maple Syrup. Uh, I'm curious as to uh, when we think of maple syrup, obviously we think of the Northeast, in particular Vermont uh, and New Hampshire, but uh, any particular reason you couldn't harvest uh, maple syrup, maple sap uh, from maple trees anywhere? Well, you, you can. Um, you, well, with limitations, they make maple syrup out to, uh, you know, as far as Wisconsin and Indiana, down into Kentucky, West Virginia, in the mountains, in Maryland, way up in the mountains, they can make it. But you have to have what is called the freeze-thaw period or the freeze-thaw cycle happening uh, in, in your region. Uh, and what that means is that you, that time of year, and it's happening now here in New England, uh, is uh, that time of year um, that when they make maple syrup is when the trees freeze at night and thaw during the day. I mean, when you think about it, that's a very delicate weather period. The trees freeze at night, thaw during the day, and that freezing and thawing churns the trees and, um, and, and causes the sap to flow. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a big proponent of maple syrup and he wanted to ma- and maple sugar. Uh, he saw it as a form, a way to make uh, for independence, economic independence from the British colonies and the sugar, uh, the white sugar industry. So he tried to make maple uh, syrup at Monticello, but 
they had didn't have the freeze thaw period, so he couldn't produce maple syrup. Uh, so that's that's the key. Having the um, that time of year, the freeze thaw cycle, when those trees are freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing, it's about a four to six week period usually. But extreme weather can affect that. Right now, this year, as we all know, we've had this very very cold period, and they are just beginning to um, get going here. Um, Baskins, where the the place I wrote about. Uh, has produced uh, about 15% of their normal crop. Uh, this time of the year, they're usually at 80%. So the concern is, I call it sort of a Canadian-type winter that's happening now, in which, you know, very far to the north, they would have cold, prolonged cold and cold and cold and freezing. And then all of a sudden, it's April, and it turns warm really fast, and the trees bud out, and it's over. So they're worried here that that, that might happen. They're hoping, hoping to get about three weeks of sap flow uh, into April, into the third week of April, so they can get their crop of maple syrup. What uh, you you probably you may know this. What percentage of the world's production of maple syrup would come then from the United States? It is about twenty percent. Quebec is by far the biggest producer of maple syrup. The U.S. and and and, and Canada were about the same uh, at, and during the time of World War II. But uh, for some reason, the Canadians. Uh, just took off in production while the U.S. industry was still in decline, um, probably because it was a way for them to make money up there, um, where you know the economy uh, is a little bit more difficult, labor's uh, work is a little bit more you know difficult. So Quebec produces uh, uh, about 70 to 80 percent of the world crop, and uh, and as a result, they control the world market and they control the world price. We're uh, we're diving deep here into the world of maple syrup, but uh, uh, I'm, as you, if I get natural, the natural syrup, the real maple syrup uh, from Vermont, not the sort of commercialized brand you find on the traditional grocery right. store shelf, uh, will I notice uh, dramatic taste differences, or is it all basically the same? You'll notice a taste difference, and the. the the, the thing that I really notice is just the way that it, it feels in, in your mouth. Um, the, the artificial syrups are based on, on corn syrup. And to my, to my taste, it's, uh, the, the feeling is it's sort of, it has a, a viscous quality. It, it, it's kind of a, a almost gelatinous when it goes into your mouth. And, and, the, and the flavor is, is, is close. I mean, it's an artificial flavor. It can get close. But real maple syrup has more of a liquidy taste, uh, and uh, and and the flavor, of course, the flavor is the real thing. It's, there's a, definitely a quality difference, but the way it moves, the way it uh, pours, and the way it feels in your mouth um, is is different. It's, it's a matter of quality, and of course, then there's the health health part of it too. Right, and what and in the phylum of the uh, as they say, the natural or real maple syrups are those pretty much the same, or do those vary maybe even by just ge- slight differences in geography? It's it's not so much geography, although there, they say that there are some differences. Some people prefer maple syrup from Vermont over, say, Maine, and some people say the maple syrup produced in most northern North Maine is the best. But what happens is over the season, when that sap first starts coming out of the tree, it's pure sucrose. And the syrup that, the, that is produced during that very first part of the season is, is very light, and it has a more delicate flavor. And some people prefer that light syrup. They call that fancy in Vermont, or they call it grade A light. But as the season progresses, there are various yeasts uh, that play upon uh, the sugars, and they convert them. So there are more sugars produced. It becomes a more complex blend of sugars. And the mineral content changes as well as the tree goes through its cycle. So the syrup, as the season progresses, tends to become darker, and it tends to have a different flavor uh, and some people say it's a richer flavor. I talked to one syrup producer in Putney, Vermont, who delivers syrup to a uh, diner in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and he was told by the waitresses that when he served the darker syrup, it's called grade B, um, when, he, when they served the syrup, they got um, better tips. 
So they would complain if he brought the lights to okay. <laughs> That is a discerning uh, palette indeed. Uh, what about, uh, as you've watched the and as you sort of track the evolution of this industry from individual families that, that sort of did it quietly on their own and maybe sold to the local general stores or whatever, and now you've got plastic tubing that's, that's hooked up to thousands of trees, are we seeing an influx at all of corporate uh, uh, sap farming, so to speak, uh, and by uh, similar to what you might find with uh, uh, with dairy cows or some other corporate farming. There's somewhat of a similarity, but it still tends to be family businesses. Although there's a corporate atmosphere, and the way Bruce Bascom puts it is that now that the price for maple syrup is good, money is coming into the business, which means um, some families or or say a company I. I went to a sugar house that was built by a family who owns a um, a uh, cement company, and um, they had enough money to invest a half a million dollars in in um, taking uh, working with the mountainside that they had and pruning out the trees that weren't maples and putting up tubing and building a sugar house. But they're still a family business, and it tends to be. Uh, now that there's a lot of expansion on the U.S. side because of the stable price, but there are family businesses building big companies because the banks will lend money now because Maple is making money. It's it's a difficult business because you have to go out into the woods uh, when there's snow on the ground and climb up hills, use snowshoes in order to tap the trees, and it's still labor-intensive for that part of the year. So getting skilled people to show up for four weeks in January and go out into the woods on snowshoes and climb up and down hills is not an easy thing to do. So um, it tends to be um, family-run businesses that are getting larger um, but that are firmly entrenched in the community. So I, I haven't yet seen a, a corporation uh, uh, you know, that come in and just kind of set up and and, and go to work and, and produce, uh, you know, successfully. That's just, it's so we shouldn't expect to see large Mrs. Butterworth farms up in Vermont. <laughs> no. You know, Miss, Mrs. Butterworth in Vermont, um, they used to, they used to um, have maple syrup in their products. I talked to someone who did a study of that at one yeah. time back in the 60s. They had 15% at one time, then they went to 8%, and then they went to 2%. I remember reading the Vermont Made label, and it said 2% maple syrup. But one of those uh, companies went to total artificial and gained market share, so they all went over to artificial. And it was a devastating time for the maple industry at that time because 2% was a big deal. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, conversely now, with the incredible uh, resurgence and return to a more natural foods and more natural diets, et cetera, et cetera, I would think that the syrup industry is enjoying some uplift off of that. They are. They think of themselves as a healthy sugar because it has minerals, amino acids, and there there have been quite a few studies that have been done. And I don't know if this is true, but I've been to some of the maple conferences and I've been to the cooking seminars and I've heard them talk about how it is that uh, diabetics are able to, um, to use this sugar. So there is research on this, and I've talked to people who have diabetes who say that they can use maple um, maple syrup, uh, whereas they c- they couldn't use these other products. So there there definitely is a uh, very much uh, an awareness of the health benefit of using this kind of sweetener uh, rather than some of the uh, the other the other kinds. Again, we're with Douglas. Why not? Uh, the work is called the Sugar Season: A Year in the Life of Maple Syrup. Douglas is a uh, well-known writer, uh, written for all kinds of magazines, uh, Smithsonian Reader's Digest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is a very unique work. Uh, as you as you sort of look back on the research and the people that you talked to and the situations you discovered, uh, I'm curious, is there a particular story or family or situation that really stands out for you? Well, it would, it would be the Bascoms, but there's one, there was one story... It's my favorite chapter in the book. It's, it's called uh, Aren't You Afraid, Mr. Bureau? And it, Bruce Bascom is the biggest processor of maple syrup in the United States, meaning he buys, he buys he, what he produces, which is huge. It's only 2 or 3% of what he buys. And the man he learned from was a Canadian uh, named uh, Real Bureau. And there, there's, there, there's just some wonderful stories about this, about this man uh, uh, getting syrup from the French Canadians and uh, bringing it bringing it to the U.S. 
So I really enjoyed writing uh, writing about him. Uh, and uh, you know, the first time he did this, he uh, uh, these farmers all came to him and they asked him if he would sell their syrup for him. So he decided to do it, and he gathered up all of these barrels and he filled seven tractor trailer trucks with 55-gallon drums full of maple syrup, and they drove off to the United States, and he was so afraid that he was going to lose them that he followed along in his car to make sure they got over the border and got, got to, the, uh, got to a, the American Maple Company in Newport, Vermont at that time. So there are some really nice stories about him that I enjoyed writing very much, partly because it was Bruce's mentor. What about uh, for those uh, that love uh, the natural maple syrup that comes in those jugs or in the interesting packaging that they have? What, uh, from where you sit, how's the future of that industry? It looks pretty bright, or what do you think? I think it looks bright. There, there are problems with the weather that that are of concern to uh, people in the maple industry. Um, I've mentioned this year, which is cold. In 2012, we had that heat wave. In the middle of March, it was the warmest March in history. Um, temperatures got up into the 80s, and it didn't freeze uh, right in the you know, second and third week of March. Um, for, for 10 days, there were 240 hours without a freeze. So uh, the maple syrup production shut right down that year. It was a terrible year. And so that brought up issues of climate change. And in some of the federal climate change reports, maple syrup industry is always coming up as one of them. Uh, that could be very uh, drastically affected by warming, uh, a warming climate and warm winters particularly, and warm nights in the winter. So it's said that it's possible that if things continue uh, as they're going and emissions continue and, and are not, you know, uh, not stabilized, that at the end of this century the maple syrup industry might be limited to the very northernmost regions of this country. Well, again, the work is The Sugar Season. It is published by DeCapo Press, uh, the author, Douglas Wynott. And uh, uh, how can we uh, get a copy of the book, and how can we find out a little bit more about the industry and the whole subject? This has been uh, an interesting one indeed. Well, um, I, I recommend going to one of your independent bookstores. Uh, they have been wonderful to me in sponsoring um, talks on my part, and they, try, they promote reading, and uh, I recommend going to independent bookstores. Uh, it can be found online at uh, Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Um, you can uh, go to my website and uh, find out information about that and uh, uh, just request it at the bookstores, I would say. All right, so you've done one now on maple syrup. What, uh, what, what do you got in your sights for next time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still looking right now. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I've just finished this book just a few months ago. The editing process finished back in November, so... I'm uh, I'm I'm looking around and I'm starting you know I'm reading the newspaper and I'm looking for a good topic. Catch right up now. maybe or Catch- <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to find something. I always write about something that has several themes. Uh, you know, I, I usually have a, I have a main character in all of my books and that's Bruce Bascom this time. And then some sort of a uh, a passion for an industry, some kind of a job and usually there has to be some kind of um uh, attention uh nationally or some kind of uh, issue involved in this case. You know, it was the it was the you know issue of the the topic of the iconic maple, and also the issue of climate change, and then the Quebec Federation of Maple Syrup Producers. So, I have to have a theme, uh, a topic that has several themes in order to really get into it to the extent where I could write a book. I I kept notes for three years. I had 980 pages of notes, single spaced. I had uh, over 400,000 words of notes, and I it took me a month to read them. So, I like to get a lot of material and then and then boil it down, so to speak. Uh, to a, a, a 280 page nar- narrative, 240 actually. Well, Douglas, why not? Thank you for spending time with us today, uh, and best of luck to the future. I'd like to have you on again. Well, thank you so much for, for your interest and for your good questions. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. 